Final Fantasy XIV used to have its very own warlock akin to the one in World of Warcraft. Let's talk about the history of the summoner, from A Realm Reborn, going over the changes through the years all the way to Shadowbringers, and then finally Endwalker, where the job was reworked. Now before we get deep into the summoner job itself, there are two core mechanics particularly relevant to summoner that worked very differently back in A Realm Reborn. The first one being the party bonus. These days, there is a direct incentive to bring at least one of every role, because each unique role represented grants the raid a blanket 1% bonus to all attributes. Before Shadowbringers, however, this worked differently. Instead, each role represented a specific attribute and granted a 3% bonus to that attribute for being present. This meant, for example, that having a bard present would boost everyone's dexterity by 3%, which isn't really helpful for a summoner, although dexterity also boosted your block and parry rate. Bringing a summoner or a black mage to your party granted everyone 3% more intelligence, which was particularly relevant because healer's damage output was dependent on intelligence back then. As such, it was always worth bringing at least one mage to every group. The second mechanic is a bit more vague, but as you may notice with both Scholar and Summoner in Endwalker, the reaction speed of your pets are surprisingly fast, at times responding in less than half a second from you issuing a command. Pets being this fast is something new in Endwalker, and even back in Shadowbringers, pets reacted much slower, often taking up to even over a second before actually performing the action you requested. How slow these reactions were in A Realm Reborn is uncertain, but it is worth bringing up right at the outset just to set expectations for pets. On top of this, debuff applications also happened slower, so you often had to delay any action that relied on a specific debuff, like a dot, an extra GCD after the dot was applied to be sure. Now, there are certainly more weird features from back in A Realm Reborn, like sprint casting TP, however, most of these are not super significant for a summoner, so we will skip over those. With that out of the way, let's look at the strange history of the summoner, Final Fantasy XIV's very own warlock, starting with A Realm Reborn. Unlike any other class, the fact that Arcanist has two jobs attached to it mattered a lot more back in A Realm Reborn, because both Scholar and Summoner get to have the entire Arcanist package, with the exception being that Scholar replaces the summons with fairies. For this reason, it is slightly significant to make a distinction between Arcanist actions and Summoner actions. I did call the Summoner Final Fantasy XIV's very own Warlock from World of Warcraft, so let me just start by taking a moment to go over the clearest similarities. Keeping in mind that Yoshi P publicly stated that WoW was used as reference and inspiration material for A Realm Reborn. The Arcanist's toolkit by level 12 includes a dot with a cast time that includes upfront damage, an instant dot that does not do upfront damage, and an instant debuff that reduces the target's physical damage. Quite reminiscent of Warlock's Emulate, Talented Corruption, and Curse of Weakness. Another similarity is that the pets the Arcanist and Summoner gets in order are a ranged magical pet, a melee tanking pet, and a melee DPS pet. The only pet Warlock gets the Summoner cannot compare to is the Fell Hunter, which fit a niche that didn't really exist in Final Fantasy XIV. I wanted to mention these similarities, as I find it quite significant to the evolution of the job, as we will see how the job evolves into something more unique over time. Now with that side quest done, the toolkit of the Arcanist and Summoner was very different from today. Ruin and Ruin 2 served as filler attacks, with Ruin 2 causing Blind as a side effect. Ruin 2 was also instant like it is now for Scholars. Both Ruin's potencies were so incredibly low that almost anything else took priority over them. Bio was an instant dot, Bio 2 was a longer dot with a cast time, and Miasma was a dot with upfront damage and cast time that additionally reduced the target's healing received and their movement speed. And yes, you could apply all three. Miasma 2 was an instant dot applied in an AoE around you with the same side effects as Miasma 1, but a far weaker total damage, specifically making it not worth it on a single target. Finally, for Arcanist GCD attacks, Shadow Flare had a long 3 second cast time and placed down a circle doing a lot of damage for 30 seconds, which could apply an attack speed slow as a side effect. The damage was high enough that it might have been worth keeping up all the time, but the cost allegedly was also very high, so doing so in a drawn out battle might run you out of MP. For the summoner's GCD attacks, they just had Tri Disaster. Pay attention to that name, it'll come up again later. Which, also with the 3 second cast time, did 
absolutely terrible AoE damage while binding the enemies for 20 seconds. Next, the Arcanist has Aether Flow, granting 1, 2 and 3 Aether Flow as you level up, while also recovering 20% MP on a minute cooldown. To spend Aether Flow, Energy Drain is very similar to how Scholar's Energy Drain works now, except this version also granted MP. Bane spread Bio, Bio 2 and Miasma 1 to nearby enemies, similar to PvP Scholar's deployment tactics. And then summoners get faster, which does damage entirely based on how many among Bio, Bio 2 and Miasma 1 are on the target. This generally meant that on single target, all Aether Flow was spent on Fester, while on AoE, clever use of Bane greatly improved your damage. Notably, Bane spread the dots precisely as they are, making the damage quite incredible if the enemy is livid. For the pets, the only difference is that Arcanist used Carbuncles that were weaker, so let's focus on Summoner here. As you may know, there is a dedicated pet hotbar that is not very helpful nowadays. But back in the day, you commanded your pets to use actions directly in that hotbar and it did not require you to weave actions to do so or anything. Furthermore, pets had their own HP and could die from damage. Now, Garuda was ranged and had access to a knockback, a ranged AoE attack and contagion, which once a minute could extend your three main dots durations by 15 seconds, which is a massive amount of free damage. Garuda being ranged was very handy in certain fights since your pet could absolutely die to random AoE damage back then. Titan's toolkit includes multiple attacks that generated extra enmity, allowing it to tank, alongside a defensive cooldown about as strong as Rampart, as well as a stun. Ifrit also came with a stun, as well as a reflective shield. Overall, Ifrit had the capacity to do slightly more damage than Garuda, but being melee made it a lot riskier to use. Garuda offering Contagion also made it more significantly impactful to your own rotation. The Arcanist could assist their pet with Rouse, boosting its damage and healing output, useful for scholars, by 40% with a third uptime. It could also heal the pet with Sustain, paying 10% of their own life and a GZD to heal the pet for most of its HP over 10 seconds. The summoner additionally could boost the pet's damage output by 40% with a 6th uptime with Spur, and in Kindle on a massive 5 minute cooldown, cause the pet to use its signature move which ultimately amounts to a high potency AoE attack for all three. Naturally, stacking all three of these cooldowns together could result in some massive damage numbers, at least for a pet. Oh, and also, the Arcanist had a trait that gave them a chance to gain a spell speed boost which sounded like a lot when the pet did critical damage. For defensive tools, the Arcanist had Eye for an Eye which placed a barrier on someone else which had a chance to reduce all damage attackers did by 10%. Virus, which I have previously stated was a spell, turns out to be an ability, reduces all attributes except vitality and piety on the target for a bit effectively reducing the target's damage and healing output as a raid defensive cooldown. This ability was available as a cross-class action, but it also reducing magical attributes was unique to the Arcanist itself. Finally, Arcanist had Physic, which was of course only important for scholars, not really for summoners. And then there were the cross-class actions. In A Realm Reborn, cross-class actions were a handful of options you could unlock by leveling other classes up to use on your current job. By level 50, you would be allowed to pick up to 5 amongst a set list of actions. Summoner had a few to choose from Thaumaturge and Archer, however, Hawk's Eye increased physical accuracy, making it useless for the summoner, meaning of course that the summoner automatically picked the remaining 5. Quelling Strikes reduced enmity done, which was a lot more helpful before Shatterbringers than it is now. Raging Strikes increased damage done by 20% for 20 seconds on a 3 minute cooldown, which greatly compensated for the summoner itself lacking any damage boosting cooldowns for themselves. Swiftcast worked exactly as it does today, although right at the very beginning, Swiftcast actually had a 3 minute cooldown. Surecast prevented spellcast interruption for one spell every 30 seconds and did not block knockbacks. And finally, Thunder offered the summoner an additional dot to apply, which did more damage than Ruin, but notably caused a significant amount of MP, meaning that in a long drawn out fight it might actually not be worth using. Take note also that all of the summoner toolkit interacting with dots would ignore Thunder. With this toolkit, I imagine the summoner would start a fight by precasting Shadow Flare and then using Raging Strikes, Rouse and Spur and then applying each dot, finishing with Bio 1 while simultaneously ordering the pet actions and then weaving Aether Flow. 
After that, repeatedly using Ruin 2 to find time to weave in Kindle and Festus, although Festa having a 10 second cooldown did mean it would take a while to get all those ether flows spent. After that, keeping dots up and filling with Ruin would probably be the filler rotation, with Shadow Flare and Thunder standing out as actions that you only sometimes use if there is MP to spare to do so. If the triple weave while the GCD is ready after the Shadow Flare is giving you pause, take note that back in a Realm Reborn, Weaving was a lot more finicky, and simply due to the amount of buffs you had to apply at times, people just opted to mash all the buffs before attacking, as it was somehow more reliable. With the release of Heavensward, we discover that apparently Arcanist and Summoner is almost perfect, considering they received hardly any changes to their existing toolkits. The only significant change being that Enkindle's cooldown was reduced to 3 minutes. Oh, and Tri Disaster was renamed to Tri Bind, which gives us more time to talk about the new actions. Pain Flare was introduced as an AoE alternative to Fester, although it just did damage normally with no dot reliance, making it stronger on two targets. However, the radius of Pain Flare was apparently painfully small. Ruin 3 is introduced, doing far more damage than Ruin 1. However, as there is not explicitly a trait replacing it, it is a possibility that the MP cost of Ruin 3 made it unfeasible to use exclusively. Tri Disaster was reintroduced as an ability on a minute cooldown that simply applied your three main dots to the target. Anyone got a Tri Disaster rework counter? Is it on the screen? It better be. Dreadworm Trance introduced a new mechanic called Ether Trail Attunement, which is granted whenever Ether Flow is spent, and Dreadworm Trance could only be used when three stacks were accumulated. Dreadworm Trance itself boosted magic damage by 10% and lowered the cost of Ruin 3 and lasted 15 seconds. Namely, this introduced a gimmick in the opener where Pain Flare was used on single target to be able to spend the three initial ether flows within 10 seconds, which wouldn't be possible with just Fester. Finally, Death Flare was an ability you could use only during Dreadworm Trance, and also immediately ended Dreadworm Trance, making a significant part of the summoner's burst about fitting as many Rune 3s in Dreadworm Trance as you could, while still sneaking in Death Flare before it ran out. This then leads us on to Stormblood, meaning the laws of cross-class actions and the introduction of the role actions, as well as the introduction of job gauges, although admittedly the summoner job gauge wasn't that incredibly wild. Losing cross-class actions mainly mean the loss of raging strikes, and thunder depending on how much it was actually used. With the introduction of role actions, the summoner got access to a handful of new tools, like cross-class actions, you could pick 5, and summoner's options include Addle, No More Virus, Diversion, which was basically Quelling Strikes, Lucid Dreaming, which also cut all your enmity in half while recovering a lot of MP on a 2 minute cooldown. Swiftcast was also included, and Surecast had its knockback immunity added, but kept its 30 second cooldown. Apocatastasis, previously exclusive to Black Mage, was added as a magic defensive cooldown to use on someone else. We also got Break, doing meh damage, but applying a 20% heavy for 20 seconds. Drain, which did slightly more damage while also healing the summoner. Mana Shift, which allowed you to pass 20% of your max MP to someone else, which might be useful, but could be a problem if used too generously. And finally Erase, which removed a dot on someone else while also healing them a bit as an ability. The obvious choices for summoner were Swiftcast, Lucid Dreaming, Mana Shift, Diversion and Surecast. Which meant you actually had to make a choice at all, unlike with the cross-class system. Oh, and if you're wondering what happened to Eye for an Eye, it landed in the healer role actions pool. For the summoner's own actions, a lot more changes happened compared to Heaven's Ward. Miasma no longer does anything beyond the damage part, and Miasma 2 was made exclusive to Scholar. Sustain no longer costs HP, and Bio now naturally upgrades into Bio 2, disabling you from applying both. Tribind got an effect applied to it that made it viable to use for AoE during Dreadworm Trance. Festa's potency was adjusted to account for there only being two dots, and both it and Pain Flare had their cooldowns reduced to 5 seconds. Spur was removed, leaving only Rouse for boosting your pet's performance. Bane now spreads gradually weaker versions of the dots, and Shadow Flare was reworked to a minute cooldown ability with a similar effect. Interestingly, Shadow Flare being unusable with other area creating actions meant scholars couldn't place down sacred soil during Shadow Flare. Oh, and the random spell speed boosting trait from your pet's crits was also removed. Ruin 3 was also reworked to upgrade Ruin, and instead was only slightly stronger. Dreadworm Trance then instead made Ruin 3 instant. Death Flare also had a gradual damage drop off applied to it. 
Finally, try disaster still applied to dodge, but had the third disaster instead be that all rune spells do slightly more damage for a bit. Oh, and Dreadworm Trance also reset the cooldown of Tri Disaster, meaning that 3 out of 4 applications of your dots could be done with just Tri Disaster. Now, where's that Tri Disaster rework counter? For the pets, Garuda's Contagion was reworked to instead increase the target's magic damage taken by 10% with a 25% uptime, and Ifrit's Reflective Shield increased the target's physical damage taken by 2%. The Garuda change meant that in particularly magic-heavy group compositions, Garuda would sometimes be objectively stronger than Ifrit, but otherwise not much changed. For new things, Enhanced Ruin 2 meant that sometimes when the pet attacked, it would grant further ruin, turning Ruin 2 into Ruin 4 as a proc, which you then wanted to use immediately. Either Pact commanded your pet to cast Devotion, which was a raid buff that boosted damage and healing done and reduced damage taken, and due to the oddities of pet mechanics, introduced an extremely absurd trick that I have previously nicknamed the Devotion Dance. I explain this in more detail in this video on ridiculous openers, but the idea is that you could issue the command and then force the pet to run around the arena for a long time to delay the actual cast while the cooldown ticked down for yourself, allowing you to chain them in the opener of a fight. Bio 3 and Miasma 3 also replaced Bio 2 and Miasma 1, greatly boosting their potencies. The enhanced Enkindle trait made the proc that upgraded Ruin 2 to Ruin 4 also reduce the cooldown of Enkindle, getting you extra uses occasionally. And finally, Dreadworm Trance was upgraded to grant a stack of Trance Gauge when it ended. When you had two, you could cast Summon Bahamut. Note that Dreadworm Trance could not be used while Bahamut was summoned or vice versa. Bahamut would fight for you in place of your pet for 20 seconds, automatically casting Worm Wave and could be ordered to cast Achmon twice in the duration of the summon using Enkindle Bahamut. The sudden back and forth of pets highlighted the issue commonly known as ghosting as the slow reaction of pets often meant they would not be able to finish your commands. Akmon not going through if Bahamut unsummoned mid-cast, or any action your Aegi pet would be casting when you summoned Bahamut. It is worth mentioning that Dreadworm Trance and Bahamut both were abilities at this time, compared to today. And with Shadowbringers, the concept of commanding your pet's actions directly in the pet hotbar was ended, alongside the concept of pets having HP at all, meaning we had to do it in a different way. Role actions were also greatly simplified. We now only have four role actions left, with Addle, Swiftcast, Lucid Dreaming, and Surecast, all of which are equipped with their Endwarper effects, except Addle, which still lowers intelligence and mind. I want to highlight that if you want the really long version of this part, I actually made detailed guides for both level 1 to 50 and 51 to 80 of the summoner in Shadowbringers, with the high level version functioning as a time capsule specifically for this purpose. Anyway, over the years, the act of summoning was simplified further and further. In Stormblood, cast times were reduced from 6 to 3 seconds, and with Shadowbringers, they were turned into instant abilities. Summoners lost access to Aetherflow and instead used Energy Drain to get two Aetherflow stacks once every 30 seconds. Festa and Painflare worked the same as before, with Festa now doing a third of its damage regardless of dots. Bane no longer cost anything to use. Energy Siphon was also introduced as an AoE alternative to Energy Drain, and Outburst was introduced as an AoE alternative to Ruin, removing Tribind completely. Enkindle also had its cooldown reduced to 2 minutes instead of the random reduction from Stormblood. Speaking of Enhanced Ruin 2, it instead was a guaranteed activation whenever Iggy Assault 1 was used, and you could hold up to 4 users at a time. Shadow Flare was also removed, and finally, Tri Disaster's Ruin Damage Boosting effect was replaced with instead just doing upfront damage. Where's that rework counter? For new actions, Eggy Assault 1 and 2 were, at first OGCDs, but later GCDs that commanded your Eggy to use its first or second action, both of which were attacks, except Titan's first action, which instead was a shield to compensate for it no longer being capable of tanking for you. The pets were also reworked to serve even more specific purposes. Garuda does more AoE damage, Titan has a defensive cooldown, and Ifrit does more single target damage. Notably, Titan's Aegis Assault 1 being defensive means it did not grant further ruin for Ruin 4, effectively making it considered useless in raids. Both Aegis Assaults served as great mobility options as they were instant, on 30 second cooldowns that could hold 2 charges each, although Ghosting could still mess this up if Summon Bahamut was coming up shortly. Dreadworm Trance was adjusted to grant two stacks of the now renamed Dreadworm Ether, immediately allowing using Bahamut, and Dreadworm Trance now changes to Firebird Trance after Bahamut leaves. 
Firebird Trance replaces Ruin and Outburst with two far stronger attacks, Fountain of Fire doing single target damage and Brand of Purgatory doing AoE damage, with Fountain of Fire boosting Brand of Purgatory so the attacks optimally need to be done in pairs. Firebird Trance also summoned Phoenix, which essentially did all the same things as Bahamut, but also applied a heal over time to everyone. For traits, eventually Aegisol 2 would also grant the further ruin effect, and Bane would be upgraded to always max out the duration of dots it copied. This caused the summoner rotation to work as a 2 minute cycle, with two 1 minute rotations splitting it up. The Aegi Assaults and further ruins allowed the summoner to plan a ridiculous amount of mobility, further enhanced by Firebird Trance. Weirdly, you only had to manually apply your dots once every 2 minutes, making it feel like an afterthought. The Aether Flows also felt a lot like a tacked on addition because they were already there. All the ghosting and pet jank also left a lot to be desired and the question was ultimately whether this could be made more consistent or something else needed to be done. Which heralded the end of the Warlock Summoner style, with Endwalker, where the job was completely remade from the ground up, completely removing dots, eggy attacks and more. Yet somehow, some way, Physic still survived, completely unchanged. Summons were instead momentary attacks that empowered your attacks, and Summon Bahamut and Phoenix were both similar empowered trances that simply had a single target and AoE attack. Energy Drain, Siphon, Fester, and Pain Flare also all survived, with only getting two Aether Flow per minute now. Instead of pets being an important part of the toolkit, you simply needed a pet present to use certain actions, almost like a token summon, and the only action your summon would actively use is Radiant Aegis. Either pack was replaced with Searing Light, a raid buff at first used by your summon, but later moved to the player itself, again due to ghosting problems. Ruin stayed as the filler attack, and Outburst was the AoE that eventually upgraded to Tri Disaster, whose three disasters now simply is that it beats Ruin on three or more targets. Bring that counter back up again. Ruin 4 was available once after each energy drain. Basically, the entirety of the summoner toolkit is single target and AoE option for everything and each summon comes with one signature action on top of temporarily giving access to the right and catastrophes associated with them. A 1-2 combo attack for Ifrit, Gunbreaker's continuation combo effect for Titan, and Slipstream, a placeful AoE for Garuda. Bahamut still offers Death Flare, and Phoenix grants Rekindle, a single target heal. Summoner's journey through the years made it start as a somewhat complex job, that even had MP management where you had to weigh what spells were worth casting to keep up the attack efficiently, while also managing a pet with its own unique mechanics, and gradually had an overwhelming burst phase involving greater summons like Bahamut overshadow this basic toolkit. The introduction of Lucid Dreaming in Stormblood almost certainly also completely removed the major MP issues of the job. In fact, even by Stormblood, you only had to apply your dots once every two minutes, making it a very minor part of the rotation. And in Shadowbringers, even pet management had been drastically simplified, and still the job had basic mechanical issues with ghosting. All this caused Summoner to be considered probably the hardest job to play at this time, or at least among the hardest, due to how strictly you needed to manage certain cooldowns, or it messed up your damage for two minutes. Ultimately, Endwalker concluded that it was easier to uproot the entire thing and start over, not even including dots. Which is not too surprising considering even more recent job changes, like Paladin specifically losing its primary dot. Summoner's Journey brought it from being a super difficult job to the most difficult job to the easiest job in the game. Now, I hope you found this trip through time interesting, nostalgic or enlightening. But either way, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support me and my channel, you can like the video, leave a comment, subscribe and hit the bell to get notified when next I post a video. And if you want to keep even more support than that, you can also become a member of the channel like these wonderful people here. Fun fact, at the very start of Endwalker, Fountain of Fire and Brand of Purgatory were identical in power to the Bahamut equivalents, which meant that Rekindle not doing damage and Death Flare doing damage meant that when you unlocked Phoenix at level 80, it was actually a DPS loss to the job, as the lack of Death Flare made Phoenix objectively weaker. This was changed quite early in Endwalker by buffing Fountain of Fire and Brand of Purgatory, actually making Phoenix superior on AoE.